Welcome to N20XX. This series takes the listener, year by year, into the future. From 2040 to 2195. If you like emerging tech, ecotech, futurism, permaculture, apocalyptic survival scenarios, and disruptive science, sit back and enjoy short stories that showcase my research into how the future may play out. Ed Cruz made his initial fortune with methane-free meat, selling devices that collect methane from farm animals. As customer demand for methane-free meat rose, so did his fortune. His blonde, full head of hair is impeccable. His fine clothes always hint at ruggedness, leather browns, and denim blues. In his high school years, some kids called him the ostrich. Now at 51, his buff body makes his head look scrawnier than it would have on its original scrawny body. Still, it matters little to him. No one cares very much about his looks, it's how goddamn rich he is that makes everyone hustle around him like children around the ice cream truck. His mountainside mansion is quiet inside, even as a helicopter lands on the attached landing deck. The exterior walls are a foot thick with insulation. All the windows are enormous, many paned, and framed by extra wide window sills. In a spacious living room, a robot arm hangs down from the ceiling, vacuuming the furniture. Its cameras circle around, continually remapping its world. A 10-foot-high, chiseled wood door glides open. Meg, Ed's new, third wife, strolls in, arms outstretched. Oh, I love it. Ed follows. Good. I'm glad. They just got home from their honeymoon. The two-ton robot arm retracts to the ceiling high above. Two labradoodles run in, claws slipping on the stone floor. Meg rushes to them. You brought my babies. Ed sits on a gray couch that could comfortably seat 20. His brand new mansion overlooks an above-ground portion of the North Line, the Megaway under construction. When complete, six regular-size hyperloops and two shipping-size hyperloops will connect Seattle to New York and branch off all along the northern border. The North Line is the largest privately funded project in U.S. history, though hardly anyone knows that. Most news outlets, owned by the same people who funded North Line, have said little about it. The rise of real estate costs in the North is bad enough as it is. Already other new buildings are rising up from the Montana mountainside outside. Green dots the gray slope as snowflakes fall. In the dimness of evening, he can see the lights of a Canadian city across the border. Two years ago, a fire destroyed all the homes in this area, and he got many great deals. The nearest Indian reservation won't let him near their land. The loops had to go around. Indians get harder to negotiate with all the time. He can respect that. Their lobby groups are a bugger to wrestle with, but where would the natives be if folks didn't bring their money to the casinos all the time? Still, the reservations are just acres and acres of unused land. Land up here will be the new gold rush. He will have to look into how he can get some of their land. Everyone has a price. Meg sits down beside him. I've told the dogs to stay on that rug over there. Ed says, yes, that's good. These evangelical women expect you to be fatherly toward them. Isn't that a big part of it? Patriarchy? He was raised mostly by his mother and aunt, so he feels like he's acting, but she doesn't seem to mind. Maybe he's supposed to be acting. She followed his gaze out the window. What other properties do you own? He points, that one is mine. That one and the one just over that ridge. The tower over there is part of the north line. She says, and we'll have a link to it from here? He turns and points at a refurbished elevator doorway that operated inside a New York law firm in the 1920s. That elevator will take us to it. She says, how fun. He gazes at her smile. That smile has got him hooked. Her neck is so thin, and she's a perfect beauty. She could be a model for those starched white blouses and gold jewelry that she wears. She is evangelical. In that way, their marriage is like a royal wedding or a dynasty wedding. Something like that, 
wedding him to one of the most powerful groups in the nation. Her brother is running for senator, and her niece wants to be a judge, no less. The power the evangelicals hold these days doesn't surprise him. These are the most uncertain of times, and religion offers certainty. Play nice with the evangelicals. Play nice with the Indians. He says, well, I'm sure you're dying to. Don't let me stop you. She says, oh, I will then. There's that knowing smirk. Her head almost always tilts a little. It's the current gesture of being a step above. She stands. I'll just call her in the other room. He says, okay. She takes out her phone and walks out of the room. Mother? The dogs follow after her. He thumps the table. A glass-like sheet rises and glows with text and images. He flicks his finger to scroll messages and notices one from Scout 7. With a couple of hand gestures, he starts a video call. A woman with Asian features regards him with utmost professionalism. I'm here. He says, what have you got for me? She says, I found something that could be a whole new approach. He says, what do you mean? Why would I need a new approach? Scout 7 sighs. Closed blinds and a marker board make up her background. Mostly your gene editing, right? Each attempt takes at least a few years to see if it's promising. You'll never find it in time at that rate, not even if you can prolong your own life. Ed says, so why have I hired you? She says, I'm in Rwanda, and I've met a doctor who has uncovered an unusual cancer. If cancer were a life form, this would be its latest development. So many effective treatments are coming out. It needs to evolve or die out. The cancer she found can go undetectable for years because it replaces cells with cells that continue to work for the body. He tries to see how this could be useful to him. Okay. He snorts with frustration because usually he catches on fast. She says, theoretically, it could replace every cell in the body and the body would remain alive. It can't do that now, but. He says, and this will allow us to gene edit an entire adult? She says, it could replace all cells with new cells with young cells. He says, but you said it's cancer. She says, not after we change it. Sir, I'm very encouraged by this find. Now he feels that good old excitement that he lives for. I believe you. I want a full report, but go ahead and extract. Is it just one doctor or a team? She says, two others may be involved or know about it. He says, are we buying or taking? She says, I'll make sure not to leave any leads, but I think it's a clean buy. I've already gotten her to take down all online leads, and she says she'll let me audit her lab files. He says, great. Impresses as always. Do what you need to do. He taps the air and the video call disappears, darkening the screen to transparent, revealing the mountain view behind. Quickly, Ed turns around. Meg stands behind him. You're working on becoming immortal? Ed blushes. Well, I would like to live a little longer before I go to heaven. Meg pretends his mentioning heaven isn't disingenuous. She laughs encouragingly and walks around the couch to sit beside him. Sensing what could be a problematic situation, she puts on her smile, the smile that makes people feel she's on their side, a co-conspirator. The ever so slightly hooked smile makes people feel she's already in on it, whatever it might be. Her manner convinces them she already wholeheartedly agrees with whatever they have on their mind. It's not exactly a secret that you're working on longevity, though it's all hearsay as far as I know. Ed says, and you do remember the contracts you signed. Meg blinks. That's the first time you've brought that up, and you've shared so many scandalous things with me. Her flirtatious glee strains, but not enough to show. He looks down, and a grin comes over his face. She says, I agree with your scout. That doctor could win the Nobel Prize if she can replace old cells with new cells. He says, oh, I won't share the discovery. She smiles slyly. Not even if it saves lives? She's got him. 
this will play out well. He says, listen, close. If mortality were cured on a grand scale, it would destroy the economy. I'm not talking about it wrecking the economy. It would end the economy. The human race would eat itself alive. We're already headed toward a bottleneck that only a few will survive. She nods. Natural death is the bottleneck? He says, no, I'm talking about what will happen in the near future. I mean a collapse that mankind has been heading towards for hundreds of years. She says, are you working on that also? He laughs, and she joins him. He says, on saving everyone? The masses, 99% of the people? What's to be done about it? I know what to do. We leave them alone. They're both the problem and the solution. They're the disease and the inevitable cure for that disease. Meg raises her eyebrows to show intrigue. Maybe his fatherly act hasn't been entirely an act. Why didn't he show this side of himself before? Should she worry? He could be a monster? What about important people? He pats her knee. They'll be fine. Plenty will survive and have multitudes of robots to make life on Earth nice for them. The industrious will sail through this, but humanity will need to shed surplus population, not just in America, but all over. She says, my family are horse breeders. What will happen to them? He says, no, no, don't worry. The survivors will want artisans to add to the quality of life. Her family aren't artisans. He makes it sound like they belong in a circus. She watches him, giving him the smile that sets men at ease and encourages them to talk freely. He bows his head and softens his voice. It's no one's fault. Young America bred a certain kind of man. The steelworkers and coal miners never survived off critical thinking. The man America bred is self-sacrificing but expects to be led. In other words, he feels someone out there owes him a job, a pre-planned routine that guarantees all his needs are met. He does not like change because someone who wanted change would not last long as a miner. He wants things to stay the same because for decades, that kind of personality survived when others died. Try to get a building crew to use a new building material, and you will see what I'm talking about. However they learn to build a house in their youth, that's how they want to build a house for the rest of their lives. Meg leans in closer. What about universal basic income? He says, America's man is bred to work. Your family breeds horses. Have you ever seen a racehorse only allowed to eat grass on a little plot of land? He'll get restless and self-harming if he isn't given what he's been bred to be given, a nine-to-five job. She says, so let them. He says, let them go. We aren't their guardians. They're a breed who lost a master, but I don't want to be their new master. She says, when do you think this big change will happen? He says, I don't think it could be much more than 30 years from now. She says, but there are more jobs than ever. He says, yes, for now, for now. He looks out the window. Imagine a planet with only a million people living on it instead of nine billion. The great forest that covered these mountains could grow back. Meg says, if you can regain youth, which I believe you can, will you share it with me? Can I be young again? He shifts with confusion and looks up at the ceiling while thinking. I suppose if we're still married. She tries to keep the smile from freezing on her face. She'll need to keep her wits if she's going to ride this horse for very long. Everything will be okay. She still has a firm grip on the reins.